Sorry it's so hot in here, the air conditioner just got turned on. All right, Genesis 16, Genesis 16. Genesis chapter 16. Uh, starting verse 7. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the which sure. He said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence comest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Uh, and the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand will be against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And then she called the name of the Lord, that spake unto her, uh, Thou, uh, God, seest me. Uh, for she said, uh, Have I also here looked? After him that seeth me, and then uh, wherefore the world um, was called Beer Laha Roy. Behold, it was uh, between Kadesh and uh, Bered. And then Hagar bare Abraham a son, and Abram called his son's name, uh, which Hagar bare Ishmael. And then Abraham was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare uh, Ishmael to Abraham. Now later on, he's going to be kicked out of the house altogether uh, because of. Well, in part because of the promise that would be given, or that not that would be given, that was already given to uh, Abram and Sarah, uh, and that uh, Ishmael isn't going to be an uh, inheritor of that promise, so he's not, he's not in uh, Christ's lineage. And then as well, also because of Sarah's uh, jealousy, uh, because Ishmael was going to be making fun of uh, Isaac. So that, that'll be further down. Okay, so this morning we are looking at Islam. Now you're wondering, okay, why is this brought up with this in particular? Um, Ishmael's descendants would later inha in inhabit the majority of the Sinai Peninsula, uh, as well as uh, it's where modern Arabia is, uh, actually older Arabia as well. But not everyone that is Islamic is of uh Ishmael's descendancy. Uh, nevertheless, the majority of the people, and then it's believed to be as far as Muhammad was, men from of the peoples that were of Ishmael's descendancy, even though Islamists aren't all of uh, Ishmael's bloodline necessarily. Okay. So. I'm just going to put up the video real quick. Okay. That's all. I should be able to flash it on there. Did you set it up? It should just, like, read it, play, right? You turn that one off. My bad. Cool. Okay, so Islam is. For one, a false religion, and then also it's a political ideology. It is originated in Mecca, not Medina, as I um, had, uh, was previously understood to be. Question while you're figuring that out. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that the Lord told uh, Hagar to submit to Sarah. And Islam, I'm told, means submission. Yes. I wondered if I wondered if uh, Muhammad somehow heard that story and used it to name his religion. It's brought about. Um, he was illiterate. So anything he would have learned would have been just by 
anything that would have been word of mouth. Uh, he himself uh, was, he had seizures. I forget, I forget the technical term that you use for that. If somebody has seizures, but basically he's, he has mm -hmm. seizures. Um, when he actually came up with not just the ideology, but and also as far as like the tenets, because he actually never wrote anything. He was illiterate. So I know that. He would have his, uh, his followers write everything for him. And so it was primarily word of mouth. You had four people that were, I guess, credited with being the ones that would go ahead and disseminate what would be the teachings. And then he, in particular, uh, would be, oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, he would be just the one that would get, he, very similar to how Mormonism started as far as with Joseph Smith, uh, he was overtaken by a spirit. Now he credited as being the Gabriel, uh, the angel Gabriel, uh, God's messenger, uh, to him, giving him new revelation. Uh, but even at that time in 7th century, he, he lived from 610 to about 632, so he didn't live very long. Um, but he, uh, as far as 80, I'm sorry, when, uh, even during the time in Arabia, you had a small Jewish community and then as well as you had uh, Christians. So he, he would have been exposed to, um, in his travels with the Messiah Peninsula as far as um, monotheistic religion and then also to Abrahamic religion. Um, he did copy a lot. If we, when we, if we were going to look, well, we'll see some of it. When we look at some of their tenets, um, especially the monotheism, uh, and that, that would be more from Judaism than anything else. Uh, not that you don't have any Christianity, but there's a big divergence as far as they say that uh, the Trinity or, you know, the Godhead is idolatry because how can God be, you know, multiple? Uh, you know, is he split personality? Uh, they also deny the fact that uh, Christ would have been God because how can God, um, you know, be flesh? If flesh is evil, then, you know, Christ can have been God because uh, he was flesh. And then, so th those are some of the things in particular as far as where there's a, a distinction, differentiation. But that would be... Yes. Does that answer the question? No. Or does it? All right, stop. Go ahead. <laughs> Let's go. It gets better reception over there. That'd be good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we can often learn something important about a religion just by examining its name. The name Christianity, for instance, draws attention to the importance of Christ in Christianity. Similarly, the word Islam tells us something about the religion preached by Muhammad. Islam is Arabic for submission or surrender, and in its religious context, the term refers to submitting one's will to Allah, the Arabic word for God. The word Muslim means one who submits to Allah. So we can already tell that Islam is going to have a lot to do with submitting to God. And Muslims who preach Islam in the West emphasize this when they preach. They say, Islam just means submission to God. You want to submit to God, don't you? Well then, Islam is the religion for you. Now, if the message of Islam were simply submit to God, Christians and Jews would agree. We want to submit to God. But the message of Islam isn't just that you must submit to God. It's a message about how you must submit to God. According to Islam, you submit to God by doing certain things and by believing certain things. And Islam has two convenient lists for us, a list of the most important deeds, called the Five Pillars, and a list of the most important beliefs, called the Six Articles of Faith. The Five Pillars of Islam, the Five Most Important Practices, are Shahada, Salat, Zakat, Saum, and Hajj. Shahada means testimony. To become a Muslim, all you have to do is recite the words La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. By reciting this testimony of faith, or creed, a person formally submits to Allah and Muhammad. Salat refers to prayer and worship. Muslims are required to pray five times per day. These prayers are memorized recitations in Arabic that are accompanied by specified bodily positions, standing, prostrating, and sitting. 
Muslims perform ceremonial washings called ablutions before prayers, and they pray facing the Kaaba, which is a cube-shaped shrine in Mecca. Zakat refers to almsgiving, which is required of all Muslims except for those who are extremely poor. Muslims have to give one-fortieth of any monetary wealth they've held for an entire year, along with various percentages of agricultural products, livestock, and other goods. Saum is Islamic fasting, which is especially associated with Ramadan, the ninth month of the Islamic lunar calendar. When fasting, Muslims are required to abstain from food, beverages, and sexual intercourse during daylight hours, so from dawn till sunset. <coughs> the Hajj is the pilgrimage to Mecca. Every Muslim who is physically and financially able must take a pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in life. The communal Hajj takes place annually during the 12th month of the Islamic calendar. Muslims circle the Kaaba seven times, run or walk back and forth between the nearby hills of Safa and Marwa, pelt walls with pebbles to symbolize stoning the devil, things like that. So Islam requires submission to Allah, and Muslims demonstrate their submission by performing these five deeds. Muslims are also required to believe certain things. These are summarized in the six articles of faith. Belief in Allah, belief in angels, belief in inspired books, belief in prophets, belief in the day of judgment, and belief in predestination. And these beliefs aren't just some kind of intellectual assent to the existence of God or the existence of angels. They require belief in what Islam teaches about God, angels, and so on. So belief in Allah isn't just belief that God exists, it's belief in the Islamic view of God. Most importantly, that Allah is one, with no division in essence or person. The oneness of Allah, a doctrine called Tawheed, is so central to Islam that denying Allah's oneness is the worst sin a person can commit in Islam. It's the sin of shirk, associating partners with Allah. The second article of faith is belief in angels. In Islam, angels are created from light and are incapable of disobeying Allah. So there are no fallen angels in Islam. Iblis, or Satan, is one of the jinn. Jinn are created from fire rather than from light and may rebel against Allah. Then there's belief in Allah's revealed books. The Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority, not only of the Quran, but also of the Torah, the Psalms, and the Gospel. Muslims have to believe in Allah's prophets. Counting Muhammad, the Quran mentions 25 prophets by name, though there are numerous unnamed prophets as well. The most respected prophets in Islam are Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Belief in the Day of Judgment includes belief in a general resurrection of the dead, followed by a final reckoning. After hearing their deeds read from a scroll, faithful Muslims will enter Jannah, the garden or paradise, while unbelievers and hypocrites will be thrown into Jahannam, referring to hell. Belief in predestination is interesting. Some passages of the Quran suggest that human beings are ultimately responsible for their own actions, but passages indicating Allah's complete control over human actions are clearer and more common. If you do right, it's because Allah wanted you to do right. If you do wrong, it's because Allah wanted you to do wrong. Allah controls everything we do. So, those are the basics of Islam. There are a lot more beliefs and practices. And okay, uh, with regard to a few things that he had mentioned, uh, with regard to the inspired books, even though it is mentioned that the Psalms, the Torah, uh, which would be your first five <laughs> books of the Old Testament, uh, are inspired, uh, and they're acknowledged throughout. Uh, they have a teaching called abrogation, so basically anything that would be new revelation down the road, uh, given because they, they still believe in, in, they don't believe like in completed revelation, uh, as we would. Uh, and they also believe that um, basically scripture is corrupted because it's uh, Judeo-centric, as far as uh, even though you have acknowledgement within, within uh within the Quran as far as that, okay, these portions of the Bible are actually valid. Uh, the, they, they later address that by saying, well, it's been corrupted by man, so that's why we were given Quran to be able to go ahead and have mm -hmm. God's true revelation. But even then, you don't really have full revelation. Uh, and then with regard to uh, paradise or going into what they would consider heaven, the fact is nobody has any certainty whatsoever in Islam as far as to whether or not they'll be accepted of God. So it's very similar to, um, well, like a Calvinist or uh, you can go through as far as any other works-based religion as far as because they're trying to please God, but they don't have a certainty. Uh, God is very distant. Um, we'll, I'm going to put up another video that also addresses as far as differences between Christianity in particular uh, and, and Islam, but they are not accustomed to having as far as what we would 
with regard to a relationship with God, that God is personal, that he's actually <clears throat> interested in my life, that I could actually pray to him as if he were, you know, not just, okay, distant, great, higher being, but rather, you know, he's my father. In other words, yes? So there's only, so basically Islam is another, uh, another religion that basically that it teaches that you cannot, there's no, even, there's no one certain way. It's just, it's just a whole life of doing good and hoping you would get to your destination, the, 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 de the, the appointed destination, or heaven, or whatever. Yeah, basically. Yeah. There are some things. That's why the, the whole jihad and the, um, the suicide bombing thing is clearly. Oh, no, I'm not that yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Those are those are the reason you know when um, there are some guarantees when you do when you die in in, in jihad. Oh, in a certain oh, yeah. there's cer there's a certain method that guarantees. Yeah, so if you go pull yourself up, you, you made it. This one's going to be addressing more of the differences. service provider isn't the best in this building. Christians and Muslims agree on a number of issues. We agree that there is one God, all-powerful, all-knowing, and merciful. We agree that God has sent messengers into the world and that people like Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David were mighty prophets. Concerning Jesus, we agree that he was born of a virgin, that he performed miracles, and that he is the Messiah. But there are some fundamental differences between Islam and Christianity, and we can break these differences down into three categories, theology, ethics, and evidence. Let's start with theology. According to the Bible, God is a trinity. The Bible calls the Father God, it calls Jesus God, and it calls the Holy Spirit God. And yet the Bible consistently affirms that there's only one God. This is the basis for the doctrine of the trinity. The Quran declares that Allah is not a trinity, and that anyone who calls Allah a trinity is a blasphemer. In both the Old and New Testaments, believers, Jews and Christians, refer to God as their Father in Heaven. The Quran repeatedly declares that Allah is a Father to no one. This is why you don't hear Muslims calling God Father. The highest relationship you can have with Allah, according to the Quran, is a slave to master relationship. The Bible says that God loves everyone. The Quran says that Allah doesn't love unbelievers. He doesn't love the proud. He doesn't love ungrateful sinners. He doesn't love those who exceed the limits. He doesn't love the extravagant. He doesn't love mischief makers. Allah doesn't love most people. And this difference in God's love leads to another important theological disagreement between Christians and Muslims. In Christianity, God loves us so much that he enters the world as Jesus of Nazareth to become the perfect sacrifice for our sins. When Muslims hear this, it makes no sense to them because they have no concept of a God who loves people enough to do something like that. Allah's deficient love leads to the second category of disagreement between Christianity and Islam, the ethical disagreements. Jesus commanded his followers, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Notice, as Christians, we have to love others. Why? Because God loves them. But as we've seen, Allah doesn't love unbelievers. So the command in Islam is not, love your enemies, it's fight those who do not believe in Allah. The emphasis on love in Christianity affects all our relationships. In Ephesians 5.25, the Apostle Paul says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus was crucified for the church, and Paul tells husbands to love our wives the same way. In Christianity, husbands are supposed to love our wives so much that we should be ready to be crucified for them. In Islam, Allah says that you can beat your wife into submission. Very different attitude towards wives, and this ultimately goes back to differences in God's love in Christianity and Islam. The third category is evidence. In Christianity, we have good evidence for what we believe. I grew up as an atheist. I started studying Christianity because I wanted to refute a Christian I knew. I understood from reading and discussions that the apostles based their faith on Jesus' resurrection. So I started studying the resurrection in order to prove that Christianity was false. 
What I found was that every shred of evidence we have tells us that Jesus died by crucifixion. We know this from ancient Christian writers, ancient Jewish writers, and ancient Roman writers. And every shred of evidence we have tells us that Jesus was alive again later. He appeared to more than 500 people at one time. The historical facts just can't be explained without a miracle. But Jesus' resurrection takes us even further. Jesus was raised from the dead. He must have God's stamp of approval. God confirmed Jesus' message by raising him from the dead. So now we have to believe what Jesus claimed about himself. And Jesus claimed to be the divine Son of God who came into the world to die on the cross for the sins of others. I realized this as an atheist. I realized that if I wanted to go where the evidence pointed, I had to believe what Jesus said. Islam just doesn't have anything like this. The main argument offered by the Quran is that the Quran is so wonderfully written, it must come from God. And this is one of the strangest arguments ever offered by any religion. Even if the Quran were the most amazing book ever written, this wouldn't make it the word of God. It would just mean that the Quran had the best writer in history. But in fact, the Quran isn't the most amazing book ever written. Far from it. Let me quote what the Iranian scholar, Ali Dashti, wrote in his book, 23 years. The Quran contains sentences which are incomplete and not fully intelligible without the aid of commentaries, foreign words, unfamiliar Arabic words, and words used with other than the normal meaning. Adjectives and verbs inflected without observance of the concords of gender and number, illogically and ungrammatically applied pronouns which sometimes have no referent, and predicates which in rhymed passages are often remote from the subject. These and other such aberrations in the language have given scope to critics who deny the Quran's eloquence. So the main argument of the Quran fails miserably and other arguments for Islam are even worse. This means that there's no good evidence for Islam, but we have very good evidence for Christianity. And since Christians have proof for what we believe, this confirms our theology and our ethics whenever our theology and ethics disagree with Islam. That's it. You need some more. No, no, that's it. Okay. Okay. Um, what he what he addressed was as far as with regard to or what we're going to finish looking at today is going to be the difference in that you have personal relationship with God and then they have, you don't really have that, which we already addressed. And then also as well is that um, we have reliable um, with regard to the word of God. Uh, that's how you get to know anything as far as with regard to who God is, what God is like. Um, and not only just for means of salvation, but as far as like, how to live. Uh, God's preserved his word. Uh, they don't have that. You would you would be able to go ahead and look if you were to read it. They, most Islamists would argue that you would have to be able to go ahead and read it in Arabic. Okay, so in other words, you wouldn't be able to go ahead and just, because um, when, if you were to go and have somebody that would faithfully render from Arabic into uh, English, which there are uh, there are a number of uh, uh, Quran translations from Arabic into English. You'd, you'd still come up to the same conclusion as far as what uh, he had uh, posted there at the end. It's rather intelli unintelligible. In other words, there's a lot of things that don't make sense uh, altogether uh, beyond just the fact that there's a lot of um, <coughs> scientific... <laughs> well, yeah, that. And then, and then you also have a lot of like, scientific error uh, when, it, when it addresses issues of science, and then also you have a lot of just really wild uh, belief system. Uh, they also have a few other books as similar to, with Judaism in that they have um, the Mishnah and the Talmud, uh, but they don't, that's, that's in Judaism, but as far as like with regard to Islam, that they would have uh, your commentary on what they think it means. And then from there, you have um, everybody running around just basically getting from the commentary, um, basing their opinion, but in reality they don't even have any kind of knowledge as far as like who God is, what he's like, because they don't really have any truth with regard to what God is, what he's like uh, from their uh, supposed holy book. And so we have advantage in that we have God's word, um, the hard part is going to be as far as whenever you're going to deal with somebody that uh, is entrenched in Islam is first off finding a, a listening ear. Um, 
the thing I don't think he mentioned is the fact that you have a death penalty on you with regard to uh, converting. You'll, if you dissent uh, from not just Islamic tradition, but as far as you dissent from uh, teaching uh, that is given, then you're, you're, uh, you're able to be killed. Uh, and and um, most uh, Islamic dominant countries, as far as where uh, Sharia is instituted, uh, that is very commonplace. So it's very difficult for any believers that are there uh, to just even exist uh, to begin with. But, uh, you know, God, obviously God's able. Um, but that's one of the things that you're going to have uh, conflict with as far as when you're dealing with somebody that is from an Islamic background. The fact that, you know, if I come to Christ, then I can be killed. Okay, I could have a uh, legal pronouncement on me uh, that, you know, anybody in my family or anybody that would have association with me that is Islamist is free to kill me at any time. I mean, our laws are different over here in the U.S., uh, but nonetheless, they don't, they don't see that. They would see that, okay, this would be in devotion to God, and since uh, somebody that would be committing unbelief or they would be committing mischief in the land, which is a very broad term, or uh, any of the number of things that would be a violation of Islamic law or Islamic teaching uh, carries with it a death penalty. And so, uh, first off, just coming to having somebody <coughs> give ear to that. And then a uh, few things as well. Um, they need to know truth with regard to uh, the background and the foundation. Um, but as with anything, you don't really get very far as far as attacking necessarily, but you do need to bring uh, to challenge with regard to, okay, well, how would you know? You want to, you wanna, um, as with anything else, as far as you want to ask questions, as far as it's going to prompt them to think that's going to challenge their worldview, uh, that's going to, and I mean, there's going to be conflict in that regardless. You can't, you can't avoid that. There's no easy way as far as to go ahead, but um, just straight out um, attacking Muhammad. Some of the things about Muhammad's character with regard to, uh, th these are uh, well-documented facts, okay? Um, they allow for polygamy. Uh, he himself was a polygamist. Uh, one of his first wives, Aisha, he married at six years old and then consummated the marriage when she was nine years old. Okay, that's uh, pedophilia here in the U.S. Uh, or actually anybody that is... Pedophilia. <laughs> yeah, anybody in their right mind, I should say. Um, but they would allow for that because uh, that's the example that he set. Uh, and as, he st uh, as Brother Wood had stated, uh, you can beat your wife into submission. Uh, if she, you know, actually... It's pretty terrible being a woman under Islam because the fact is they're not seen as equal. You're actually seen, in a sense, as subhuman. Yes, you guys see that you know, article last week where the Saudi prince lost, or he was doing high stakes gambling, and he lost 350 million and five of his wives, and the, um, he has nine wives, and so he lost five of them gambling. And in Islam, your wives are your property. I mean, and the Sharia teaches that women are property. You know, it's, it, it's incredible the issue we're having in the United States with senators and, uh, and different politicians being sworn into office on a Koran which represents Sharia law and the implications of it are being seen when child abuse is allowed in our court systems by, because they, you know, especially, in, and it's a major problem in Britain and other countries, but, you know, when these fathers are, are, um, torturing or murdering their daughters for not submitting, uh, you know, to marry who they want to. They won't, If the daughter doesn't want to marry a four-year-old man or whatever when she's a child, you know, and then the father throws acid on her or kills her in our, our court system, you know, because of this wanting to condone Sharia or not go against Islam, you know, is really reflective. And a lot of Christians don't think about the significance of the reality that our laws are based on the Torah and based on the law that God gave Israel. Now, that we're not Israel. We, we're not a theocracy. 
but our law system was based on a God who didn't treat women as as less. It's interesting, even you know, God always, the Lord always hated putting away, and uh, Jesus said about Moses allowing for divorce that was because of hardness of heart. But it, the legal law, the legal law even protected women in divorce, in uh, in in God's law. In other words, God didn't condone it or approve it, but He gave protections because God doesn't see women as inferior or superior. You know, sees them as equal. Anyway, sorry, interruption. No, that's fine. That's true. Uh, no, I didn't see that article. I didn't know that. Um, with regard also to unbelievers, um, anything taken in spoil, they're free to go ahead and do with as they please. So they're viewed as property. In other words, if you are in battle, um, if you're if you're waging jihad, okay, and you capture unbelievers, okay, so anybody that's not Islamic and they don't want to convert, you can kill them, but you can take also as far as them as property. In other words, you can you can enslave them. Uh, women in particular and the, boys. Yes, you can uh, you can do with. Homosexuality, as you please, as far as uh, whatever your uh, perverted heart desires, with regard to whatever your quote unquote fulfilling your needs is. Uh, not that, not that that's approved. I'm just saying that's that's their uh, that's their mentality as for driving because that's uh, that is what is taught, and that was the example that was given or that was set with regard to uh, Muhammad in the expansion and then also as far as how he conducted his life. Um, but we have advantage in that we have truth. We have God's spirit in us and then we also have ability to be able to watch God work in a heart whenever we share truth to uh, not just Islamic unbeliever but as far as just anybody. Um, you know, in the power of the Holy Spirit uh, I mean, you can see just walls break down, and you can see just people, lives change. Yes, ma'am. Um, our son had a podcast regarding a, a woman that came out of Islam from another country and came to America, and um, they were asking, asking her how to, how best to reach Islamic people, you know, Muslim people, and you know, they're right now in the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, the Muslims are not the majority, they're the minority, so they're less, um, they're less likely to be as violent or, so we don't need to be afraid, because we do have the truth. But one thing that we do have in common from Christians and um, Muslims was, is that the Islamic people are very hospitable, and if you have a neighbor, not to be afraid, but to open your home to um, just to start those relationships and find out if they have dietary issues or whatever and make like a vegetarian meal or whatever because they're not, they don't eat pork and they don't eat some of those kind of things. But she really encouraged, because she was Muslim and she became a believer and her whole family has come to Christ through this, but just to reach out as neighbors um, to build those relationships even with hospitality and you know, people will listen to you when there's a relationship started, and you can start engaging in conversations with them just relationally. And when they begin to trust you, and listen and observe, I know my son in China worked with Muslim people all the time, and he, um, they just observed their lifestyle. And one of the young men looked at, he was, uh, he looked at Scott as almost a father figure, even though Scott wasn't old enough to be his father but just really admired the relationship that he had between he and his wife and he and his children and wanted to model his family after that. Um, so there was things just, and they would invite them over to their home. They kind of, their whole home is abstained from pork just to accommodate um, witnessing and, you know, being a, an example. So, you know, they, the extreme of it can be very violent and, you know, the potential is there, but most like, like uh, they're, they're nominal, some of them are just nominal, and they don't even get into the Quran themselves, so they don't even know what they're, 
what they're doing. Well, that's the key. That's the key uh, to, to witnessing to Islamists is yeah. that just like, and this this kind of ties in with our what we've been doing on Saturdays with our soul winning saturation. You know, a lot of times we want to have an answer for how to deal with false doctrine in a belief. So there, there's a big difference between knowing knowing the religion and what's behind it, like Mormonism or Islam, and trying to reach the nominal Islamist. Completely different. For instance, I've, I have had the privilege of leading countless Jewish people to the Lord. I, 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 I don't want to make an extreme statement here, but I've noticed that the guys that focus on winning Jews very seldom lead Jews to the Lord. You know, so they have specialized Jewish ministries to reach Jews, but they, they, they are preparing themselves to debate the doctrines that Jews believe that they don't even know. You know, and it's you know I tell people all the time, preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. You know, don't rip the New Testament out of your Bible. It's the power of God unto salvation, and so preach the word of God. And when somebody says they're Jewish, you know, the quickest way to get back to the gospel is say, well, you know what, uh, you still need to be saved. Mm -hmm. It's it's incredible. I mean, the first time I ever said that to somebody was a teenager. We were going into, uh, we we were doing a thing with our teenagers, and we'd go into. Uh, it was the mall off of Glades. What's that one? Boca, the town center mall. So we're going to town center mall to just distribute tracks for a teen activity. And it was just kind of a fun thing. And one of our teenagers handed a track to a teenage girl. She said, oh, I'm Jewish. She's like, she couldn't take it. I said, we still need to be saved. She said, oh, okay. And she takes the, takes the track. That's usually the conversation. That's normally the conversation. My Muslim neighbors, they don't know Islam. They don't know. I'm not going to get into them about Muhammad being a pedophile. That's not the conversation we're going to have. We're going to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. But it, Muslims are supposed to believe everything in the Quran, and, and Muhammad is a pedophile. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I know. So there does come a point, if they're open and they're saying, okay, I need to look at what I believe, there is going to be a point when you're right. going to go there. But it's a you know? relationship. Yeah. So it's like Tony, one, a friend of his years ago uh, from Turkey. And he didn't know anything about Islam. Mm -hmm. He just, you know, he was just, I'm, I'm Islam, man. That's, that's what I am. But after he really kind of looked at at Islam, he goes, "I'm not. That's not what I am, you know." And so, yeah, you're born Islam because you're born in that family, in that country, just like being Catholic or just like being Jewish. So it's a good. It's a point well taken. But what what he's teaching is not about uh, winning in Islam. It's what he's teaching is what do, what do Islamists believe if they believe what they believe? And just like many Christians, this is why a lot of Christians get one to the Jehovah's Witnesses. Because they go, oh, did you know that God? <laughs> you know, it's like something new. Well, the bottom line is that Christian doesn't know anything about God. He's never read his Bible and uh, has never grown spiritually. And that person is always easy to win. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a, it's an excellent point. My, my, my Muslim neighbors are some of the kindest, friendliest, mm -hmm. open people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so. But in an Islamic country, they could, they could be put to death for talking oh, to you. So yeah. it's... It's real. As yeah, soon as the, as soon as that fifty one percent happens, mm -hmm. it's a different game. Mm -hmm. Really, probably thirty percent. Mm -hmm. You know, like what you see in Germany happening right That's now. That's what my son said. As soon as they become the majority, then mm -hmm. yeah, it's a different ball yeah. game. It's just like I, I don't mean hijack this. No, no, no. Year, years ago, I um, got to lead a Jewish man to the Lord on his deathbed, and he had spent years working in Saudi Arabia. And I remember he used to talk to me about the hypocrisy of religion. And he, he would say, when we would fly into Saudi Arabia, he said, before you get there, then the women you know, go into the bathrooms and they change in, out of their Western clothes and they put on their burqas and they put on, you know. And I, he said, as soon as we're, he said, when you're flying out, all of a sudden, everybody, you know, you know, guys start flirting with women and they, I mean, everything gets, mm -hmm. you know, just totally, you know, and it's, there's just a lot of hypocrisy in it. But when you land on that soil, you're going to be put to death. For doing the very things you're doing on the airplane while you're flying out. So, anyway. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes. So, just, um, you win them over, as with anybody else, really, um, by love, but. Um, depend on the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the message. Uh, don't
fear of the conflict or the friction that you're going to encounter uh, as really with anybody else because that's that's inevitable uh, you don't have to be nasty in your disposition as far as when you're approaching anybody um, but um, you're going to have there's, there's going to be a, a collision with truth with regard to when you're dealing with anybody um, really from any kind of divergent background uh, but especially with regard to Islam with so different or so vast like a gap with regard to just even just the basics of, of God you know he's personal uh, just that concept alone uh, something that's could be very <laughs> very unique and very very different um, does anybody have any questions Quite a few things I'd like to have a groundhog. In a few days I'd love to have a groundhog day on. Have the same day over and over and over again. But like I said, if I lived on if I lived on the western side of Pennsylvania, you wouldn't have the we wouldn't have a groundhog day anymore because I had to shot the groundhog. <laughs> Probably is. <laughs> yeah, six we have to take you six weeks of winter. I can try to do uh, it. I don't care. I can do it. 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 I can what? Would you just bury the groundhog then? Would you just bury the groundhog then? That would develop a good recipe. Oh. How's it taste? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you take the ground off and you scan and clean them and everything, mm -hmm. and you can get this board and you no, can cover it with garlic and butter and all that kind of stuff. You can fasten the ground off to the board. If you yeah. put it in the oven and roast it for about six hours. I know how this is going to be. There's a lot of free things. A lot of free things. Of free things. You got a fire house. <laughs> That's what they say about uh, a lot of fish. Like, they tell you how to prep it and throw the fish away and eat the, eat the sea plant. Loose. <laughs> That's actually a good one. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta arrange it. I mean, so you it's not well, getting it above freezing all we have. Yeah, yeah. Earth, yeah. Earth, yeah. Earth, yeah. Earth, yeah. Pretty much anything north of Mississippi. It's not getting it above freezing all we have. And when you press the gas or it's like a good 10 seconds. They're probably oh, getting above freezing. You, you, you want to do something? <laughs> okay, I'll think about that. <laughs> Like, you know, you're pressing this button. I have this one. Oh, and it's just okay. I'm saying our intersection, like, can I start turning? You know, I'm hoping that that gets Well, here, it's terrible, but here's my hope. I'm hoping it'll be for this one. The reason the free board is when it is, they're going to be implicated in Oh, and then you're to charge how you charge the I'll go to the to get it. I had that for a while. I got that. I don't know what her actual name is. I don't know what her actual name is. Remember when you turned 70? 
I don't remember when you turned five. I don't. I'm not. 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 I'm
with other believers celebrating the resurrection of our Savior Jesus. God, thank you so much this morning that even as we learned in Sunday school that God, we get to be your children. We get to call you Father. It's such an incredible thing that we who were dead in our trespasses and sins could still be loved when we were ungodly and without strength. And you're just such an amazing God that you deserve the praise and the glory. We want you to have it here today. God, we want you to have the preeminence in this service this hour. You deserve it. And God, we don't want to take anything away from you. Help us not today to do anything in man's strength, man's wisdom. And God, ultimately, we just we want to have your presence here today. So we desire and ask for, the, for your spirit 